Hello, everyone. Thank you guys so, 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 so much for joining us for this lovely, lovely program, Writing About Our Identities. I hope that you guys are all doing well amidst everything happening with the pandemic, uh, everything happening since the verdict on Breonna Taylor's case. Um, I hope that everyone is taking some time to sort of really sit, time to rest, time to rejuvenate, um, and time to really have conversations and think. And hopefully, since you're here, you're looking forward to listening and engaging in conversation. So I have the lovely pleasure of introducing this event. It is part of Otis's Focus Series, which is an initiative that offers students in the wider community the opportunity to participate in discussions with foremost anti-racist thinkers, writers, artists, and activists. Focus is one of the few initiatives that Otis is currently working on to encourage students to keep anti-racism in the forefront of their experiences. Another initiative that um, we're currently working on is the Otis Arts EI circuit, which focuses more on anti-racist work within the performing arts community um, and specifically aims to help students and student groups decolonize their artistic or administrative practices. I think that one of the beautiful things about this event as part of, of, as part of FOCUS and also the Otis Arts EDI circuit is the way that we are starting to really ignite and activate our communities, connecting across campus, connecting across departments, connecting across disciplines, connecting with alumni and so on and so on. And it's been a really beautiful thing to sort of gather together for, you know, the Princeton community to really make this happen. So. Thank you guys so much for that. Thank you to my Otis staff peers for that as well, who are currently on this call. Just so you all know, in case you didn't hear the little Zoom voice, this program is being recorded. Please use the chat feature or the, sorry, my apologies, the Q&A feature to ask any questions that you may have um, once we start getting to the Q&A portion. If you have questions before then though, of course, like drop them in there. Um, someone might answer it like just directly in there or we will answer it out loud once we get to that portion of the event. Okay, great. Um, so the next thing I have the pleasure of doing is introducing our lovely, lovely panelists and our lovely, lovely moderator who will be on the call, both Morgan Jerkins, class of 2014, Rakesh Satyal, class of 2002, and the lovely Tracy K. Smith. So Morgan Jerkins, uh, a true powerhouse in the publishing industry, both as an editor at Zora and a New York Times bestselling author. Morgan also is a visiting assistant professor at Columbia University School of the Arts. You may know Morgan more specifically by her collection of essays, This Will Be My Undoing, but she currently has another book that has recently come out called Wandering Strange Lands. Um, I encourage everyone to read a little synopsis of the book. It's truly, truly inspiring. And I just wanna, first of all, thank Morgan for giving us such an offering and such an opportunity, especially for Black American folks to be able to uh, have a through line in a story that is just as much about all of us as it is about Morgan's own family, Morgan's own journey, Morgan's own heritage, and her own sort of rediscovery um, and providing an entryway point for all of us to be able to experience that. So thank you. The next person is Rakesh Satyal. Super interesting. Rakesh, wow. Okay. So another publishing powerhouse we definitely have here. He's worked in publishing since 2001 and is currently the executive editor at Harper One. Um, his first book, Blue Boy, won a Lambda Literary Award, and both Blue Boy and his second book, um, No One Can Pronounce My Name, are being made into movies, interestingly enough. Um, little Princeton fun fact, Rakesh is the founder of sort of the, the Dean's Date Celebration Originator, you know, the thing that Princeton students do where like folks are sort of running their turn in, like all their assignments and there's clapping, and then at the end there's like food and everyone's like, yay, yay, yay. Rakesh really originated that. Uh, so thank Thank you for that from fellow Princetonian to another. Um, Burkesh also has a cabaret performance that he does in New York. He was a former Nassoon as well. Um, and as far as thanks to Rakesh, I just want to say thank you for your work in your book, especially No One Can Pronounce My Name. I think that uh, 
it has really helped a lot of folks see that we do exist even when no one is watching and even the parts of us that don't seem flashy or exciting or may seem a little controversial also exist even when we are not in front of others so thank you so much for Kesh for your offering in that regard and the last person I have the honor of introducing is of course Tracy K Smith so Tracy K. Smith is the former U.S. Poet Laureate, current chair of the Lewis Center for the Arts, and a Pulitzer Prize award-winning author. Her award-winning canon includes Life on Mars, Duende, The Body's Question, Ordinary Light, and Wade in the Water. Tracy also has been a librettist for two operas and has a podcast called The Slowdown. Um, the podcast, The Slowdown, is one of my favorite podcasts in this entire world. Um, as a new employee to Princeton, it was one of the sort of like linchpins, I guess, in so many ways of my routine. Um, and it was just a wonderful way always for me to sort of like wake up. So Tracy, to you, my offering is thanks for helping folks build a relationship with poetry that sort of transcends what we see on the page, but extends to our day-to-day -day lives. So thank you for that. And without further ado, Tracy, if you would like to take it away, thank you guys. Thanks so much, Jessica, for that lovely introduction. And welcome to our guests. I'm really um, honored to be able to chat with you, ask my questions, and I will share. I know our audience will also have a lot of questions for you, so they will come a time when, when they can take over. Um, I'll just kind of start with a framing observation and then I have some questions. Um, no one can pronounce my name, and Wandering in Strange Lands are very different books. One is a novel about the lives of Indian Americans living outside of Cleveland, Ohio in the Obama era. The other is a work of nonfiction that explores private narratives of members of Morgan's family dating back to the Great Migration. And of course, this work also sheds light on the collective experience of Black people throughout America's history. Uh, but one important point of in intersection between these works is that both are concerned with how we define and achieve various forms of community. Both are thinking about how the stories that we claim about who we are, what we come from, what we belong to, can serve to both free and sometimes limit us. And in as much ide as identity is at stake, I think it's tied up in this question of our relationship to others. Um, so I think it's really wonderful to have you both here um, to come at these questions of identity and community from really different perspectives. Morgan, um, you, your search for community, um, you kind of describe it as an act of recovery. You write, much of the information lost during major internal migrations of African Americans has yet to be accounted for. Documentation takes precedence over oral history, a Eurocentric outlook that prioritizes the written word over our own voices. If we were to take my life as an example, documentation initially proved that half of my parentage was lost, even though I knew who my father was. What of the countless families whose lives have been documented, but whose realities offer an opposing narrative? One of the things that you discovered was that there are really compelling reasons why certain kinds of silence are guarded by individuals or by whole branches of a family. I would love it if you could talk to us a little bit about what you learned about the silences or omissions in your own family narrative. Absolutely, thank you so much. That's such a great way to start. Um, some of the silences that have been uh, characterized in many of my family conversations have been because they just didn't know. For example, they, uh, one of the ways in which I start the book off is I talk about this, this tradition that we have every New Year's Day where we eat collard greens for uh, money because it's green and a black eyed piece for good luck. And a lot of other African American families do it. But when my, I asked my mother why we did it, she was just like, it's just something that we do. She, she had no idea. Um, it was only through the creation of this book why she found out the reason why her family left the South in the first place. 
which is because of racial terrorism. And I remember the way that my grandfather started off the story. He was like, I guess I can tell the story now. Mm -hmm. um, it had been 70 something years. And he, and he never spoke about it, I guess, because of fear. A lot of times, you know, African-American families are traumatized and don't want to speak about the past. Part of the reason why they migrated out of the South was for safety reasons um, in order to start a new chapter. And so I really was interested in the repercussions of these silences is that we often end up with gaps and omissions. And that's what was, that what was, <laughs> that was the impetus for this mm -hmm. book was that I was kind of pulling at scraps. I was like, I don't really have a cohesive narrative here, even though I've been in America my whole life. My family has been in America for several generations. So that's why I wanted to take a reverse migratory route in order to get some type of semblance of a whole. I wanted to embark on a journey that when I returned to New Jersey, I would have more than what I started out with. Mm -hmm. I was really moved by some of the stories of like, particularly when you got to California, the, you know, the, the, the West, mm -hmm. um, uh, and the period of history marked by the, the Watts riots. Mm -hmm. Um, I was marked by how many of the people that you spoke to had, um, dealt with the trauma of that experience just by compartmentalizing it, putting it away, mm -hmm. not sharing, um, yep. Yeah, I think what was devastating, but also a sobering for me is that some of the people that I came in contact with, especially in the West, um, was that all it took was just a mistake, whether it was my father was uppity, he would not cross the street for a white man, or he got into a fight with a white man, and then it's like, we got to leave in the middle of the night, because if we don't, then we're going to, like, he's going to be lynched. And so I thought about it in my own family, the stories I heard was like something happened and it was like, maybe someone spoke out of turn. Maybe someone looked someone in the eye and it's like, we have to get out of here now. And it's those split second decisions that can change the trajectory of a family forever. And even though we're, you know, miles apart from our ancestral lands in the South, we still hold on to something. So that was something that was so fascinating for me as I traveled from coast to coast, region to region, is that there still seemed to be this like cosmic connection between all of us that we were holding on to something much older than ourselves. And we may not be able to fully articulate it, but I noticed that as I was, you know, synthesizing these chapters, it felt like people were in conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. no matter where they were. So it was, it was fascinating. Yeah, it was really exciting to see how these individual stories give us a sense of, you know, we'll multiply them by the millions of lives that were mm -hmm. shaped by these very same forces. And it creates a really different portrait of America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Rakesh, I wanted to ask, uh, your novel also makes us aware of silences that characters are saddled with. Um, there are stories that your character Harit um, Ranjana and Mohan find almost impossible to tell or to talk about. And there are characters like Prashant and Achyut who are burdened by an established narrative that they really don't feel applies to them. Um, I'd love it if you could talk about what it means for your characters to struggle to claim or even choose their own stories. Oh, I love that. I mean, first of all, I, I, a lot of uh, what Morgan was saying, I love the point you made about oral versus um, read basically communication because this question of community I think is um, people forget community is spatial and I think that's a word that's come to mind the spatiality of being in this country is something I think a lot of us are thinking about and I think the thing that comes to mind to me in just this moment of anti-racist work and thinking about the black community and thinking about what's happening is that people don't think of the literal constrictions put on people so this idea that Morgan's talking about about one you know, flinching of the head or one not crossing the street or one word out of turn is a physical thing that happens. And as somebody who grew up both brown and queer in middle America, I f it took me a long time to realize that a lot of the anxiety I felt was ma manifested itself in my body, that it was a, a spatial response to um, these questions of identity and community. And so the idea of silence then becomes, I think, not only a verbal act, but a physical one, that you find a way to silence yourself. And 
especially in the queer portion, I'm, I've always been a very kind of flamboyant, you know, grandiloquent, you know, and when I was a person and as a child, I was very flamboyant and it was very, and, and I found a way to constrict myself to kind of bring that into myself. So silence also, you know, became a part of how I made it through the world, this keeping this part inside of myself. And I think when you find community, it finally gives you the permission to unlock that spatiality and to be around other people physically, which is, to be clear, why this pandemic run is so difficult for so many of us, I think, because we need that physical interaction with people to think things through, to create, to form an artistic community. So in my work, I've always tried to do that because of those identities I have to basically unlock that that physicality and then put it in the characters lives so that you see them almost in real time learning those lessons and, and learning that about themselves and freeing themselves in some way i love the way that um you're, you're talking i mean you're making me think that you know history and social dynamics there's a geometry of that um that's a really beautiful um way to put it into spatial terms and so in a way we're witnessing i mean when we see the the movement that has taken root in cities all over the nation and the way that it's manifest in the street it's it's kind of just an a literal analog for what we're kind of dealing with forming and responding to in um, psychic terms you know, you know what's funny it took me a long time to realize i was never a great math student I was terrible at it, frankly. And the one type of math I was actually good at in high school was calculus because it was three dimensional. And it actually allowed me, I think a lot of creative people maybe find something in it because it allows you to look at the world in a more, I'm not saying I'm good at math now, like I'm, I'm, it's like one course I took, but I do think it helped me unpack some of that idea about making something that seems so stayed and kind of two dimensional into something three dimensional and lived. Um. There are also really lovely ways that um, in both of the, the books, and I hope it's okay that I want to gather them together because I feel like you do, we, we are covering interesting um, common ground and really different vocabularies. But um, the ways that, that um, alliances are formed in, across surprising lines. So, you know, we, we witness Ranjana coming to kind of like understand and, and love her quirky, sometimes rude seeming co-worker, Cheryl, and, and other, other um, unlikely allegiances forming. Um, and Morgan, you talk about relationships, historical relationships that haven't been explored terribly much in history, like African American and Native American uh, connections and also frictions. Um, I'd love to hear like what thinking about um, crossing different borders, um, what that has illuminated for you, you know, either through the act of writing or, or maybe these are questions that, that you've been living with for a long time. Oh, Morgan, I think you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I was gonna say, I liked merging text. I was a comparative literature major, so I, I do that all the time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with a story, it's a very quick one, but, when I was in Oklahoma to study uh, freedmen, which are black people with indigenous ties, the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, um, the Creek and the Seminole. And I was visiting a man. He was a multiracial Creek citizen. And I'm using citizen because he was labeled as someone who had the blood, um, mm -hmm. even though he was part black as well. So that's how identification can get very messy. And I was driving into Tulsa. I was, I was working out of Oklahoma City. I was driving to Tulsa. And when I came to his house, he was getting off the phone with someone. And he said, there's this Wajena coming. And I was like, what does that mean? And he was like, it means a child of Washington because I was an American. Hmm. And I was on Creek Reservation territory. So... You know, I'm a young black woman. I'm used to territories in a sense that I've, I've already taken drives across the deep south. But in Oklahoma, it's different because it's America and then there's also reservations. You have to deal with the Oklahoma police and also the light horsemen, which is the law enforcement of the five civilized tribes and how they overlap and how they collide. Mm -hmm. So when I was out there doing field work, 
on a base level, I was like, man, America is huge. That's the base level. But um, on another level, I kind of was upset. I think when you meet other Black people and you make these assumptions, a lot of times on the internet, or a lot of Black people, young people, Black people say Black people are not a monolith. And I agree. It's one thing to say it, though, and to see it. Mm-hmm. When I was out there speaking to Seminole Freedmen, I just assumed that because we're Black, English was our first language. And he was like, no, English is not my first language. My first language is Creek. Um, and so knowing that that's not the same everywhere, um, knowing that their migration pattern was the Trail of Tears. And I was never taught that Black people and company and Indigenous Americans uh, west of the Mississippi and Indian territory known as Oklahoma. I was never taught that in school. And so I felt like a deep sense of shame. It's like, how do I not notice about my own people, about other African Americans? But I also said that I think that it, it was it was me taking accountability and just learning to humble myself and to really understand just how expansive um, African American identities are by being out in the field, but also, you know, showing a light of the failures of the American public education system by saying that it's not my fault as a Black American in this country that I was, you know, not, you know, I wasn't taught to uplift and value Black lives and our complexities as much as white lives. And I'm trying to do some of that work now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned white lives and these are, um, big subjects of both of the books, even though the focal point is on people of color. Um, Rakesh, you have uh, lots of ways that whiteness is is referenced and um, kind of like um, called out in, in your book. Um, there are um, the people who um, teach yoga classes that one of um, characters is taking. Um, and let me find my description so I, I don't like leave something out, I'm sorry. Um, uh, there is, um, oh, Mohin, the father of um, Prashant and his peers have these kind of anti-Obama attitudes that we perhaps more often associate with a, a certain faction of white America. Um, and there's also, a really moving passage um, from the chapter in which um, we get the story of um, Swati's death, and she's the the sister of of your character, Harit. Um, This is a quote from that passage. Um, The family for whom Swati normally babysat called later that afternoon, angry that she hadn't shown up. Theirs were the first voices that cracked in whimpers as Harit informed them of the accident. It was only then that Harith understood that all of these Indians who had come to the States would end their stories here. For some reason, he had always envisioned their deaths as occurring on Indian soil, their bodies cremated amidst the rustic commercial swirl of their upbringing. But there was no guarantee that they would make it back to their homeland before they died. Life wasn't a circle, but a line. The blurry opening of the film may have taken place on the subcontinent, but its counterpart, the fading into darkness was decidedly American. And I, I feel like that, um, that is an indictment of, of white America in some ways. Um, so you're challenging um, this belief in the American dream. You're challenging assimilation in some ways. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and talk about um, maybe these questions as they relate to the current vocabulary that we're all kind of adopting of white supremacy? Sure, thank you for that. I mean, a very good point of fact is that I was in copy edits of this book after the election happened. Mm. So it was a very kind of knife point revision process of trying to figure out how I was going to write about these things that were definitely a part of the DNA of the book already, but it was going to be published into a different world from perhaps where I had begun the book. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely a subject that I have thought a great deal about in the past four years and that I've tried to have substantive conversations about, especially with my immediate family, because um, that idea of the circle and line and whether or not there was going to be a kind of uh, you know, return to roots or a return to understanding and a kind of larger morality shared among the community. I think what's been so difficult to watch 
on a daily basis is watching the legacy that my parents were trying to leave in us be chipped away until maybe it's the complete opposite of what they had in mind. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is a, a victim of white supremacy. The idea that the dream, the larger sense of self that you wanted to envision and the very reasons why they came to this country, the very reasons why they wanted to have us edify ourselves and be part of a larger social fabric and to explore the different things in the world, that those are very endangered. And I think it is, you know, being in an immigrant family is frankly a daily terror. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, in the past, these past few years of this presidency, it is the idea of thinking that I, I you really, it's existential. It's really a question of what did they come here for? And do they know that we may very well not get it now, that it might just be unraveled? And it's, it's hard to answer that question. I wish I had a better answer because it's almost like trying to create language for negative space. It's kind of like trying to envision this parallel life that then veered off in November, 2016 and trying to make sense of, is there an intersection between those two things? Are they just parallel and there's no, no middle ground? So I think um, in terms of assimilation, I mean, one thing that's been difficult to watch as an Indian American is that there, you know, many people in the administration have weaponized their Indian American model minority identity to get closer to power. And that is something that is very difficult to watch um, as somebody who, um, understands that not the naivete but frank you know the ignorance coupled with wrongdoing that that represents and so um watching you know what's going to happen in the next few weeks it's, it's hard to find a kind of shared language for what that feels like and it's hard to envision you know to have these conversations with my parents to say if you didn't achieve some of those things that you thought holistically were going to come to you as a result of being here what's the meaning of what you did and what do you want us to carry into the future now that that may be endangered? So that's a bit doom and gloom, but it's, it's, it's kind of the reality of like the flip-flop of being on the daily, like thinking about this. I think. Yeah, I mean, and it's a question in a way that we all need to be asking ourselves and rooted in, in whatever sense of identity seems, um, seems to be relevant. Um, I see Bryant coming on to let me know that this is my last question coming up and then we're gonna open it up to, um, to people who are attending the webinar. Um, I wanted to invoke James Baldwin for a moment. Um, Rakesh, one of the things your title invoked for me is Baldwin's essay, Nobody Knows My Name. And Morgan, Wandering in Strange Lands is in part an examination of what freedom has and has not resolved for Blacks in America. So in Baldwin's essay, Nobody Knows My Name, he's talking about the failure of integration to solve the problems of racial prejudice and inequality in America. He's also alerting us to the dangerous lies that we tell ourselves about America when we say that we're successful at this experiment, that we've, we've eradicated um, injustice when of course it's, it's very much alive. So I've just pulled two sentences that um, I think I'd love to hear what your response is. Um, and, and here they are um, from the final paragraph of Baldwin's essay. Human freedom is a complex, difficult, and private thing. If we can liken life for a moment to a furnace, then freedom is the fire which burns away illusion. I think it's a beautiful and also chastening sentence. I just love to know, you know, what, how you would riff on that. It, um, or maybe you've been thinking about his, his work. Oh my God, that's so complex. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think when I was doing ancestral work, if you will, genealogical work, I had to cover some uh, truths that made me very uncomfortable, um, just with regards to free people of color, which I didn't know existed prior to emancipation. I didn't know that some of my family members are free people of color who were also slave owners themselves. That's not something that I was taught, um, either in my family or in, uh, in history books. And another thing that was very uh, uncomfortable for me to hear was when I went down to Louisiana to do field work and I was talking to these people who were descendants of the relations between an enslaved black woman and a French merchant. Um, and they talked about how they their progeny, uh, you know, gave birth to like this whole uh, 
Creole community, the wealthiest free people of color community in the country at one time, they never used rape. Mm-hmm. And that was very controversial. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get eaten alive for this. But I wanted to let their descendants speak. And it really got me into when we speak about freedom and we also speak about survival. And it made me think about Black women, even under enslavement, the choice or lack thereof that we have, that I never was able to consider at that point. So when I think about freedom and you know losing the illusion, it's like to not think of our ancestors as fitting into these paradigms that we've been taught. What type of choices would we have made if if our lives were teetering on death or if we're trying to, you know, help our other families out with capital? Um, these are controversial topics I've never been able to consider before. And so that quote made me think of that moment where I had to get beside myself and then let these descendants speak for themselves and to say that it, you know it's messy but our ancestors people of color black people deserve that messiness too that we can't always figure them out and we're not going to be able to know 100 percent of the interiorities and that's a good thing so that they can stop being stereotypes or static figures to us mm-hmm. amazing thank you yeah I think you know it's funny I, I've just finished it draft of the new book I've been writing. And I, the premise of it is that it's two, um, it's very loosely based on my mother and my aunt, but about two Indian immigrant graduate students who come to America in the early 70s. And you, you find out very, they're twin sisters, and you find out very early at the beginning that one of them decides to leave and one of them decides to stay. And there's a scene in which one of the characters who's kind of a talented painter is sitting and she's painting something and she gets very frustrated with it and she kind of tears it apart. And, um, and she has a kind of, thought in that moment, which is something I think about a lot, which is um, a piece of art is kind of like a human life in the sense that it, if you created it and it was there, it existed, it was something. And even if it's destroyed, it was at least there. And I think that question of freedom is, I think for a lot of us, it becomes about interiority and this kind of personal freedom of what did I achieve? And if everything else about me is going to be attacked, then at least the intellect I cultivated was something that was real and was something that I put my whole heart and soul into. And that is not nothing. That is something that existed and that's persistent if it did. And so I think that quote makes me think a great deal of that, of these, these kind of things we have to tell us and things we have to claim for ourselves that are frankly invisible, but that to us are very, very visible and are very kind of concrete for us and how we, what our lived lives are actually like. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And now um, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and um, the viewers. Thank you so much. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you all very much. And thanks to our, our many, many attendees and the questions you've submitted. Again, you can do so through the question and answer function. I'll share one here that I think is for the panel. Um, and it's uh, really, I think, about your work. And so the panel, the question asks, what do you keep in mind when writing about identities beyond your own compared to when you write about your own identities? Mm. Now that one's hard because I I usually, I I center black people, um, uh, black women a lot. Um, But I will say African-Americans, there are different type of ethnic groups under African-Americans. You have Creole, like I said, you have Freedmen, Gullah, Geechee people. And I think when I was doing Wandering in Strange Lands, I tried to make sure that I let the people speak as much as possible. And some of the stuff that even I gathered perhaps from the Schomburg or from some other New York public library, I, I used that to contextualize, but I wanted to make these people feel as full and of movement as possible. So I tried to talk about what it was like meeting them for the first time, try to talk about their life story before I got into the grit of what is at stake in these communities. So that's something that I usually keep in mind a lot is to try to just be sensitive because a lot of times when you're going into these communities, they've already been violated in a sense, whether it's because of gentrification or someone you know, using scholarship from these people's stories and not giving proper acknowledgement. So that's something that I just keep in mind is to be sensitive um, and to always go back to the source, go back to these people and to, you know, make sure everything is right. I actually want to point out, since I work in book publishing as an editor, I just want to say that, Morgan, one of the reasons why I love your book so much is because you answer the kind of vital question that we often have as editors, which is how are you going to be part of this narrative and where do you come into it? And I think that is, um, 
you do that very seamlessly and you're very strategic in terms of how you go about doing that. You honor both things. Right. And I think, um, you know, so that idea that as an editor, often I'm having these conversations with writers to whom I'm working about, to what level are they doing research? To what level are they having these conversations with other people? And I think, you know, it's worth noting that having these discussions and learning about other people and how to write about them is not a singular process. You actually should involve other people. And that in fact, it's not only people within that community, but having people who are arbiters. So if you have an editor with whom you're working or you have colleagues with whom you're conferring, that you're asking those questions and that you actually understand where you're vulnerable and don't feel like you have to be guarded about that, but actually have a conversation about that. Because I think so many people think that it's just book research or static research that they're doing. And it's frankly the opposite. It's mostly on the ground, like conversational research that you're doing. So I think that's a major part of how you learn how to write about other people is to take that step and to kind of be proactive, to, to be respectful, but at the same time to pose those questions and really see where the kind of blank spaces are in terms of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Our next question also about your writing and your processes is what authors and works have informed your process when you write about identity? Oh, well, that's a good one. So are Neil Hurston. <laughs> of course. I mean, Zora No Hurston. Okay, so going off of what Ke Rakesh said about just the research and and being on the field, I didn't want to include my, my family in this at all. And that's where I got stuck. The drafts were not coming together. And my editors were like, you can't do all this research and realize you, you don't have a stake in any of this. And I think it's because my first book was so personal that psychologically I kind of closed up like a clam. And I was like, I don't want to go there again. And, and if I did it, it wasn't going to work out. So Zora Neale Hurston taught me that I could be subjective when talking about Black people. I can talk about the rigor of folklore, just like I talk about the rigor of scientific processes when, you know, documenting human activity. Um, so I think she really um, influenced me. Um, James Baldwin influenced me. Um, Toni Morrison um, influenced me. So yeah, those are definitely people that I look, uh, look to. Oh, and Jasmine Ward too. I love Jasmine Ward. <laughs> um, I, it took me a long time to realize that the, the um, kind of centering factor of a lot of the books I loved when I was growing up was that they were frank, they were mysteries, but you didn't know it. So for example, you know, I love The Secret Garden. And The Secret Garden is, yes, you know there's a mystery in it, but it's actually a mystery novel. And a lot of people, I don't think, figure that out about what it is, because it's kind of a, you know, charming work of, you know, children's literature. And so when I got older, like, same thing, like, I love Edith Wharton. And what I realized is that there were two things at play there. There was the fact that people were, who were basically, though they were in a very rarefied set, usually the protagonists are people who feel like they're on the outside. And so even though I didn't have really a point of intersection with those people's lives were, I didn't understand that subliminally that's why I was actually connecting with the books I was reading. And so the other point I make like Morgan, Toni Morrison, most of her books are again, mystery novels. There's something at the center of them that is unsolved that she's trying to figure out or that the characters are trying to figure out. And I think I remember reading years ago that one of the things that she loved to do is she loved to read, you know, mysteries on her Kindle when she was flying. And I, I think that struck some people as surprising because she is, was a writer of such high literary fiction. But I think it's because she understood that implicitly. So I think a lot of people, you know, Baldwin, same thing like Giovanni's Room, what leads you through that book, aside, apart from the gorgeous language and the kind of observations, is the fact that you don't know what's going to actually become of these people. And so that oftentimes people who write in that vein really excite me. And that's why, like, even as a kid, I loved Sherlock Holmes. I loved Back at the Christie. And I loved, you know, people who were writing these things where I personally then realized these questions I had about myself, I was almost implicitly answering by way of the people I was reading. The next question, I think, talks a little bit about your, your remarks, Morgan, and asks, do you feel a sense of hunger among younger, younger generation to hear these types of ancestral histories, um, especially in considering that older generations um, particularly the Black people, uh, expressing those personal histories was taboo or difficult, something to be avoided. Yeah. I mean, one of the greatest things about writing my book is that I get young Black women are like, now nah, I want to ask my grandma. So I'm like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted to happen. Um, you know, there's been, I mean, I, again, I'm very vocal on Twitter and I see a lot about ancestral work, ancestors, healing intergenerational trauma, um, and I think that there is a hunger to learn more about what we don't know, but we still do almost just like involuntarily. 
So I definitely think that there is an interest in young people to hear these ancestral in histories that can illuminate kind of what we're going through right now because a lot of it is cyclical. Thanks. Uh, the next question, I think, then is almost a logical sort of uh, endpoint of all this work is, so what kind of self-care does writing about identity require for either of you? Um, that's a really good question. I think, um, I think, I think people, writing is a difficult process. It certainly is. It can be very laborious. It can be very trying. I really do think it's the moments where you realize there's supposed to be joy in it for you as the writer as being incredibly important. Because I do think, especially when you, when you have a writing community online, because we're all kind of procrastinating online, it, it becomes the idea that like writing is such a difficult task and that's why I've come to this outlet to get it out. And you know, it, it tends, tends to trend toward kind of doom and gloom. And I think the thing to remember is like when you get stuck, like when you have writer's block, part of the self-care is trying to write something that will entertain you. Like I often say that to people, write one sentence that actually surprises or entertains you as the writer. And I do think of that as a form of self-care because if you, all, if you associate your work only with gravity and the tougher things that you're trying to sort out, there'll be no levity to act as a counterpoint and you'll find no enjoyment in it. So I think, you know, especially when you're trying to write about intersectional identities and things that really require some heft, to, like an intellectual heft to get at, I think you really have to find those moments of, okay, I'm, I'm doing this for a reason, I'm doing this for a larger purpose, because it was something in me that I felt had to be done, and because I think it's doing something altruistic in the world that I believe in, and I do think that is a form of self-care. Um, for me, I just had to treat myself like a child. Like, I remember one time I was sitting on the couch right behind me, and I was researching infant slave mortalities on rice plantations and i looked out the window and the sun was going down as the sun was going down i just started feeling heavier and heavier and that's when i was like close the pdf close the tab because when you're when you're doing this work ancestral work learning at histories that you're not you're not used to uncovering it's gonna wear and tear on you and sometimes you know i'll stop everything and have like a praise break to like phil collins or i'll light a candle or i'll pray because this is something that i think i'm gonna have to deal with for the rest of my career which i'm fine with it's just trying to talk to other people call like how do you do this work um because it, it can be a, it can be a lot on the soul and i think it's so important to be kind to yourself and to understand that rest is as imperative as writing how many words you want to write through a day. So I try to tell myself that to be kind because I can often be very, very hard on myself. We have a question that sort of draws on that sense and asks, how does the fear, if any, of sharing stories of, of your family and um, limit you? And particularly if there are disagreements, right? Family becomes writing. How do you, how do you handle that, writing about your community, your family. I actually encountered that a great deal with my first book, Blue Boy, because it was very semi-autobiographical. It was not, more of it is made up than people probably assume. But it was, a, it was a telling thing because I had not, as I began writing that book, I wasn't necessarily out to the larger Indian community in which I grew up. And it's very loosely based in this community that I knew growing up. But I was very worried, obviously, about a kind of two-pronged thing, which was how are they going to react to reading about my being queer or intimating that this character is queer and then thinking I am? Or, and will they see themselves in it? Will that cause a whole ruckus in terms of where we grew up? And one of the things I say often is that I think um, I learned through that process that um, that community actually had a much higher threshold for understanding than I had assumed wrongly because they had been through the huge change of immigration itself, that they actually, I, I assume the flip side of it, which was that there was so much unknown that made them scared or um, resistant to change in somewhat because they'd been through that. But in fact, they had been through such a huge change that they had an understanding or at least a willingness to understand that I had not assumed. So I think that um, that helped in the sense of like being respectful, obviously, about people who may find themselves in the work or find their way into the work, but then also assuming, okay, well, I don't want to judge this by the limited understanding I, th I think they have. If I step outside that for a second, 
and empathize with what I think that other perspective is, am I doing justice to that? And I think that helps bridge some of that. You know, obviously there are always going to be people who see themselves in your work and take issue with it somehow, but I think that's one thing that helps is to go through that process. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting what the, the person who asked the question just said, auntie and grandmother, um, because in my family, you know, black Christian family, if you get talking about the family, the men are just like, dah, 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 dah. and that's basically like what they did. They were the ones that wanted to say everything. Um, and the way that I interviewed them was the way that I interviewed everybody else on my journey. I took my, I took my phone out, not my phone, my recorder, put it right on the table so they could see it, said, listen, if you need to go over something again, or you want me to stop it, I can stop it. Um, and so they didn't really have a disagreement because it was interesting when the brothers, my grandfather and his brothers were talking, they kind of connected and they were like, oh, I remember this. And it kept being a layering of conversations. So it really wasn't anything that they disagreed with. But as for like other black people across the country that I interviewed, I let them see the transcripts. I let them see the stuff that I wanted to include in the book, like highlighted so they can see like, was this okay? And even you know, when it was getting to the final stage and I asked them, would you like me to use a pseudonym? You know, some of these people that I included in my book, they, their lives have been threatened before. They were like, no, nope, I want you to put my name in there. And I was just incredibly moved by that. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you all. And we have another question in queue and I want to even offer perhaps this to you, Professor Smith, but it's from a colleague at another institution and they're asking for as they teach for young emerging writers of color, how do you think we can encourage them to write about their identities? And when people struggle with this type of thing, you know, they think their stories aren't important perhaps, or um, on the same thing as the sort of primary narratives out there, how would you, how would you suggest to encourage that? Well, I think one of the, the ways that we learn to write and become courageous about writing from life is when what we read can validate these questions and concerns. And so I think a big part of my job as, a, as a, an educator is to bring in work that um, acknowledges, honors, and, and sheds light on different ways of approaching questions of experience and, and concern. Um, if you want your students to, to believe that their narratives are important, then show them what, what other writers have done with, with stories that are coming from similar places. Um, show them what other writers have done, even thinking about the history that touches the lives of your students. Um, I think that's huge. And it's also really important to say that these are, these are works that we are really interested in based on the themes that they speak to. And we're also really interested in the really powerful, moving, surprising, innovative, uh, formal choices that these writers are, are using to explore the work. Um, I feel like that's, that's a way of, of making it clear that, you know, everything is welcome and of actually getting a shared vocabulary for talking about these topics, which can be difficult before your students are the guinea pigs on the, on the table. I think it's important too to think about how writing is not just about language, it is a language. So this idea of being part of a tradition of writing. And I think that's to Professor Smith's point, I think is really thinking, you know, reading as much as you can and understand that you're working within a tradition. And so becoming aware of the work that became that came before you. And again, from the flip side of my, my life as an editor, when I'm working with somebody who's writing within a certain genre or a category, that's part of the discussion we're having is what are the books that have been about this subject or tangentially related to it that have come before? And what are you doing in the work that's doing something different? So it's adding something to that tradition and having a dialogue and it's in conversation with other things that exist. So I think, you know, there is the, diff the thing that makes writing difficult, the idea that it's often solitary, is also the thing that makes it very powerful, which is the idea that that solitary perspective you're bringing can be brought into that tradition and then see itself refracted in various ways. So I think a a coming to the process of writing with that openness and a certain sense of courage to do it, I think is really an integral part of that, that tradition. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> that's been a good balance. And so we have another question that's sort of asking about um, literacy. And I think 
end up taking, recommending an approach perhaps from, from you to, or resources to incorporating these types of narratives and identities into the teaching, into expressing these things for, for their students. Helping introduce students to these, these other stories. I like the work that um, Morgan, you talk about just your process, your research process, which is interviewing people, strangers, and also family members and, and learning a lot about both of those groups from having these deliberate conversations. Um, I think that's a, an exercise that could work really well in a classroom, particularly an ESL classroom where um, you, you want to honor the languages that students live in and the stories that um, characterize their experience. And you also want to see what happens if you bring those, those, um, those voices into conversation with, with English that, you know, what, what would it look like to, to um, invite a dual language approach to some of these, these stories that are both personal and that have a public set of implications as well. And there are models, I guess, for that. I always, I always feel like it's so important to, to give my students some tools to work with, even if they're going to bend them in different directions. So finding, finding work that does that, documentary poetry or, or um, even literary nonfiction that involves uh, narrative, oral, his oral history or something like that. Well, with that, thank you. I mean, we're nearing time. And, but before we go, I do want to just express our great gratitude and thanks to each of you, Professor Smith, Morgan, Rakesh. Thank you so much for allowing us to share in eloquent fashion <laughs> your, in your conversation and your writing and, and obviously your experiences. Uh, to our audience, if you enjoyed this time together this afternoon, and I, I'm pretty sure you did, we're looking forward to more programs and conversations like this. Um, our office has something for you. Um, we will, uh, as you may have heard, again in the intro, this event is part of a monthly series focused on recognizing and addressing systemic inequality and racism on our campus and beyond. Uh, stay tuned for more information on our October conversation, which will feature Professor Danelle Padilla Peralta of Princeton University in conversation with Professor Anthony Abraham Jack of Harvard. And we'll round out our fall program with Professor LaFleur Stevens Dugan, also of Princeton, Professor Ashley Jardina of Duke University and Devin Phoenix of the University of California, Irvine. To our students who tune in, if you find yourself searching for next steps, we encourage you to consider taking a class to deepen your understanding of these issues. Um, we will continue to make a selection by each of these authors available to you each month for free. We source these titles from Source of Knowledge, which is a black owned bookstore in Newark, New Jersey. And finally, again to all, I wanna reemphasize that the issues we explore in these programs are structural, systemic, and connected and we encourage you to continue to get involved to live out Princeton's informal motto and the nation's service and the service of humanity. Um, with that in mind, please register to vote, develop a personal voting plan, and encourage others to do the same. Thank you once again, and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. <laughs>